So uh, today it is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Sanitha Vijay Kumar. Uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar is a uh, interventional cardiologist. Uh, she uh, did her uh, residency at Newark Beth Israel and stayed there to do her general cardiology and interventional cardiology fellowships. And she is uh, a newest member of the cardiology department here at MGMC and she very, very kindly has accepted our invitation today to uh, provide us with some uh, pearls uh, on interventional cardiology. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Jacob. Thank you, Dr. Albert. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Snehita Vijay Kumar. I'm one of the interventional cardiologists at uh, McFarland Cardiology. So uh, I was uh, given this topic uh, to present on interventional cardiology pearls. First, when I when they told me that, I'm like, OK, that's a very broad topic. So what do you want me to talk about? So this presentation is not for cardiologists. It's more for the regular people, primary care physicians, the nursing staff, and others, because it's covering basically on the basics of cardiology. And I try to touch uh, overall a few topics in terms of PCI management after. So let's get started. So today, we're going to be talking about, uh, I'm going to just, I don't have any videos, but I'll show you or uh, explain to you how we do a basic coronary angiogram. What are the settings when we actually need to do an intervention, and what kind of coronary interventions do we do, and how interventions have evolved over the past few years. And uh, when we do interventions, we either go through the radial artery or femoral artery axis, so we're going to touch a little on complications. And it's always important how we manage the patients after we do an intervention. So and guide a little bit in terms of for how long we have to treat them with uh, blood thinners and touch base a little about mechanical circulatory support devices. So uh, cardiac catheterization with coronary angiography is one of the most common procedures that's performed in adults with an estimated of 1.5 million procedures annually. Even though the scope of procedures performed has increased beyond just a basic right and left heart catheterization, Patient safety remains of paramount importance. So any time we get called for a diagnostic angiogram or a coronary intervention, we have to actually do a thorough evaluation of various factors. It's not just, it is a simple procedure which is done on a day-to-day -day basis, but it does come with its own complications and there is risk associated with it. So I tell, some people come to me asking, can I just get the coronary angiogram and see what's involved? And, just be done with it and don't have to worry about going through non-invasive testing, but they all come with a lot of complications, so it's good to do a pre-procedural assessment. So what do we look at in determining all these? First, like what's the indication? Like routine testing, just because they have a family history or had a family member with a heart attack doesn't, is not good enough. We have to see if they have symptoms and have they had any non-invasive studies done. Next, like what's the likelihood that they're going to be compliant with their medications? Can they tolerate blood thinners? And uh, what's the likelihood? What are the other medications that they're already taking which would increase their risk of bleeding after we put in stents? So when was the last metformin dose? Is that applicable? When are they already taking any blood thinners? And would they be able to tolerate blood thinners after like antiplatelets? Are they requiring an anticoagulation, which are stronger blood thinners like Eliquis, Warfarin, or uh, other ones which would increase the risk of bleeding if I put in a stent. And the other thing is for any angiography, we require contrast injection. So are they allergic to contrast? Will they be able to tolerate contrast when they get it during the procedure is also important. And assessing their bleeding risk, have they had any hernia surgery planned or are they having a knee replacement done? Can that wait? Can I wait to do the angiogram and procedures after the surgery or does it have to be done prior to the surgery, the timing of the procedure is important. Uh, and next, if they're inpatient or when they come from home, we want them to be fasting and not have any food because this procedure involves sedation. We don't give anesthesia, but it involves sedation where you're laying flat in bed and when you get sedated, there's risk of aspiration if you have food or fluid in your stomach. And then our and a lot of my patients who come here are older patients, like in their 80s and 90s, and what's their code status? Do they want to be resuscitated or not? Uh, because that's something where we cannot do a procedure if they're DNR, but uh, some people are DNR, but we explain to them that if you need a procedure, you have to revert to a full code status, and if 
that's the case, uh, we temporarily revert them to full court for the procedure and they go back to their DNR after the procedure. And then a focused physical exam, just mainly in my procedures, I tell my patients, you're not completely knocked out. You're sedated to the point where you're able to still talk to me. If you're anxious and you're uncomfortable, my goal is to just take your anxiety off and make you comfortable and make you lay, f you're laying flat on a very hard bed. It's not very comfortable. So we give you Worset and fentanyl, which are uh, conscious sedation drugs, but you're not getting anesthesia, so it's not like you're not going to remember it anything and people are actually talking to me during the procedure and I have them take deep breaths which helps me facilitate with the angiogram as I'm doing it especially because we have been using radial artery access a lot these days and we'll talk about that more. The next thing is if they come into the hospital with heart failure are you able to lay flat on bed like if you're requiring four pillows that's not someone who's going to be able to lay flat for the procedure or lay still so that's important and how is uh, how are the other access sites looking? Do they have any bleeding anywhere or are they at risk of bleeding? Or if they have like stenosis or any limb ischemia, they're not candidates who can get the procedure right away. And it's important that we look at their basic blood work, one hemoglobin and plate count. We don't want them to bleed after because even during the procedure, some people might think, okay, it's just a diagnostic angiogram, so how does it matter if uh, the hemoglobin is low or plate count is low? But just for the basic knowledge, when we do radial artery angiogram, we do give them heparin just for the diagnostic procedure as well. So they do get blood thinners for the procedure as well. So it's important that their hemoglobin is not extremely low or they're not having active bleeding or the platelet count is not too low that they might just bleed from that procedure. And since we have associate contrast uh, injections involved, which can cause renal damage, we have to make sure that their creatinine is at, within an accept, acceptable range. And then uh, electrolytes, when we inject contrast into the blood vessels, it, we kind of induce transient ischemia, even though we are not actually working on them. You're giving contrast, which doesn't have uh, hemoglobin it's not carrying oxygen to the blood cells so if you have electrolyte abnormalities that can predispose people to have arrhythmias on the table just from the contrast injection so it's important that the electrolytes are within normal limits and not too out of whack and then uh, PTINR and PTT so if they have gotten blood thinners uh, or if they're on Coumadin we can get away with radial access because the risk of bleeding is low but if we don't know if a patient is a candidate for radial or would they would I be able to finish my entire procedure through radial? Or if I have to switch to the groin, if their INR is like three or four and their blood is very thin, that increases the chance of bleeding, which can sometimes be life-threatening. And uh, the other thing we look at, if someone had a previous catheterization, it becomes very important. Sometimes people tell me, oh yeah, they tried to go radial last time and my arteries were tightening up and they had to switch to the groin. That's good to get that information because we don't have to waste time like attempting radial again. We can just try to go through the grind directly. Or if they have an anomaly, sometimes I look at CAT scans in patients where it says uh, an incidental finding of a right uh, anomalous subclavian artery where instead of coming from the right side, uh, your subclavian artery turns around, goes behind your foot pipe and comes from the left side and getting a catheter through the right arm and taking pictures of the arteries gets difficult and if, especially if we have to intervene, that makes the procedure difficult where we would have to switch to the groin in between the procedure where patient is, uh, has gotten anticoagulation and that's important to know and like review as much data as available. And if they've had prior interventions, it's good to know what size of the stents were placed or where was it done, when was it done. And if they had any complications during that procedure, it's good to know because someone who has had a complication with a prior procedure is at increased risk of having a complication with the procedure again. So it's good to know all that data before we get into the procedure. So there's relative contraindications to catheterizations, but there's strategies where we can get around it. One, obviously, if the patient is not able to give an informed consent, they're demented. Sometimes it's necessary, like probably they should not even be getting the procedure, but sometimes if they come in with an acute MI or they're just sick in that acute phase because they have heart failure or they're shocky and their blood pressures are low, we can obviously get consent from family member. The other thing is, are they able to lay flat without getting symptoms? Sometimes in those cases, if the procedure is required, we might just have to take help from our anesthesia friends and have them give general anesthesia or sedate them a little more, except for moderate, other than moderate conscious sedation. Pregnant patients, uh, hopefully they never require an angiogram, but sometimes we have this condition called spontaneous coronary artery dissection, or they might be more thrombogenic and have an MI because of clots. And 
if it's necessary, we obviously have to do the procedure and we can get away or minimize the chance of radiation to the baby by putting an abdominal lead shield or, and using radial access as opposed to groin access in these people. Active systemic infection, we get a lot of consults where you can have uh, elevated troponin during an active infection because the patient is uh, having an active infection and the body is stressed and maybe they're tachycardic or hypotensive from the infection. But then some people have real heart attacks because the stress itself uh, releases uh, catecholamines and that can induce stress on the heart which uh, can lead to a heart attack and they could ha be having two things at the same time. If they can wait until the infection is resolved, it's better to wait until we have treated the infection first, but sometimes if it's required, we just have to do it in the setting of getting antibiotics during the procedure. The next thing is heart failure. Uh, we want them well compensated, as I said earlier, so that they could stay on the tab uh, table still for the procedure and be able to tolerate that. So as dry as possible as they are in terms of their fluid status, it's better for them to be well compensated with a heart failure and be on oxygen therapy and not requiring ventilator support and stuff. But sometimes we would have to do that despite, uh, we have to do an angiogram or PCI despite all that if we think that's going to actually help them with the heart failure. The other conditions, as I spoke about, if they have like reactions or any coagulopathies or thrombocytopenia, we might have to just transfuse if needed, but we try to avoid uh, situations uh, like that if possible in going to a procedure. So just to talk about the percentages of risk, the overall risk of invasive catheterization-based procedures is low. Uh, the risks associated with interventional procedures are higher than that associated with the diagnostic angiogram. Serious life-threatening complications with diagnostic coronary angiography in stable patients is less than 0.1% each for death, MI, or stroke. These risk of complications goes up in patients with uh, acute coronary syndrome. So Patients uh, who are at increased risk of procedural complications include patients who actually come in sick, like uh, someone who came in with a heart attack or someone who has a shock or reduced heart function or with severe hypertension, older patients, obese patients, diabetic patients, his patients with renal failure, and uh, if they have other associated valvular diseases or uh, history of stroke or other cerebrovascular disease. So careful attention has to be paid to the pre-procedural assessment and preparation of the patient in combination with the constant vigilance and full engagement throughout the case uh, to minimize the procedural risk as much as possible. So just to show you an estimate, this is the risk anyone can have just with a diagnostic angiogram. Uh, this, I use this to like tell patients when they ask me like what's my risk of having like complications. So it's about one per, uh, actually 0.01% of chance of death, 0.002% uh, chance of an MI just with a diagnostic angiogram, and 0.9 uh, or 0.01% of pericardial tamponade if I end up damaging a vessel and result in dissection, which can happen even with diagnostic catheters, and 0.6% chance of uh, stroke and the need for emergent bypass surgery just from damage of the vessels with uh, the diagnostic catheters can also happen. The chance of it is less, but it's 0 0.2 in 10,000 patients. And uh, just to show you, we're not going to go in uh, details about this, but just they just compared or looked at the percentages of what's the chance of complications with uh, just a diagnostic catheterization versus patients who undergo PCI in a stable setting and not with an MI and patients who undergo PCI in the setting of an MI. Obviously, when they come in sick, the chance of high, uh, having complications is higher. So the risk of any adverse events uh, exponentially increases from like 1.3% to 45 And if they come in with a STEMI and we're intervening, the risk of complications is 12%. So just talks about the different complications. So. Uh, this is just to show you the basic route or the diagram of how we go in and actually access the vessel. So these days we mainly use radial artery access. Uh, in some centers, femoral artery is still being commonly used. But we initially attempt by going through the radial artery. I tell my patients usually 95% of the times, at least that's my own personal statistics, like I'm successful in finishing the procedure through the radial artery, but sometimes we would have to switch to the groin. Uh, so we access the radial artery. This is the ulnar. It's just a rough diagram. There's much more branches to the arteries. But, uh, so we go through the radial artery. We usually use a sheath, which is about six French. And 
French, when we correlate to millimeters, is three French is one millimeter. So six French is about a two millimeter catheter that goes above in this arm all the way through the subclavian and then the brachiocephalic artery and we come down the descending, uh, ascending iota and then engage the arteries. We sometimes go into the ventricle using the catheter to measure pressures. Uh, sometimes in patients with severe aortic stenosis that becomes difficult so we might not and just go directly with the angiogram. And if you see this uh, in terms of like being able to perform angiograms. The reason I was saying we have patients like awake and take deep breaths is when they take deep breaths, this anatomy, like this is very tortuous. It's not as straightforward as it looks in the picture, but this area in the subclavian can be very tortuous. And then when they take deep breaths, this gets, the diaphragm gets pulled down and then the entire heart kind of gets pulled down and this becomes more of a straight path. So a lot of times, especially when I'm going through the radial artery, I have my patients take deep breaths. And so we want the communication possible during the procedure. And if you see, when you go through the groin, it's more uncomfortable for the patient because they have to lay flat uh, and can't move much during the procedure or even after for a few hours. But it's literally a straight path. And then all the catheters are kind of made for going through the groin with only newer catheters made to go through the radial artery. So it's much more easier for me when I go through the groin, but for more of patient convenience and better safety, we go through the radial artery. And uh, this is how a routine basic uh, coronary angiogram looks like. So we have x-ray tubes that kind of rotate around the patient and take pictures in different angles. And this is the left coronary artery. So this is the left main that divides mainly into the left anterior descending and then the circumflex artery. Since it's two dimensional, unfortunately, it looks very different than the normal heart, but uh, this is how an angiogram looks. So we're injecting contrast dye and temporarily displacing the blood and actually the thing was filled with uh, contrast. Again, this takes a few seconds. So the risk of anything happened with just injection and normal vessel is very, very minimal. And this is the right coronary artery, which is like, a, it looks like a C on an angiogram. It kind of is turning around between the right atrium and right ventricle and there's multiple other branches. So when we actually look at the blood vessels, there's a lot of branches here which can have blockages, but unfortunately we can't put in stents in every blockage because the smallest stent they make is two millimeters. So sometimes you would see reports from us saying, okay, uh, the, it was not amenable to a PCI because if the vessel is less than two, then we could do balloon angioplasty and open it up, but I'll show you what's the disadvantages of that and why we don't and just treat with medications. And if there's a stenosis, I guess this picture is not as clear, but this is how it would look as a filling defect. If in STEMI patients or in people with complete heart attacks, it's a complete occlusion where you won't see anything filling beyond it, but this is like a stenosis about like 90% where you see a filling defect, you have normal blood vessel here, and then you have a cutoff sign, and then you have filling distal to that. But this just means that there's plaque that build up and cause narrowing. So we see a blockage, we just go and fix it. That's another thing. Does the patient actually meet criteria that needs to be fixed? So let's review what are the indications of PCI. So revascularization for uh, stable CAD, like when patients come into our clinic with just chest pains and, and didn't have a heart attack, it's warranted only in patients with symptoms refractory to optimal medical therapy. So we have to first start them on some medications. It could be a nitrate, a beta blocker, or we would have at least tried one or two medications before we proceed with uh, thinking about fixing it. But there are certain criteria where we might want to fix it even before medications. If, for example, we do a stress test and we see that it's very largely abnormal and involves a large area which could be life-threatening in some people, that, then that's a different scenario where we would have to proceed with an angiogram and intervention. So revascularization, uh, with PCI, unfortunately, there's no big studies that have actually shown mortality benefit with that. It's mainly for like symptom improvement and improving quality of life. But then revascularization with cabbage is indicated to improve survival in patients with multivessel CAD uh, and also have like reduced L left ventricular systolic function. In patients with three vessel CAD and normal EF, uh, cabbage may be reasonable to improve the survival as opposed to doing a PCI. And then it's a busy slide. I have like a few flow charts like going. Actually, these are available online too. ACZ has like flow charts that kind of gives us a good 
path to what to do in certain scenarios. So we're, now we're talking about only stable ischemic heart disease patients, like people who didn't have a heart attack yet. So the indications for actually going for an angiogram intervention is either to improve symptoms or are there like indications where it can actually affect survival? Like if they have multiple blockages or if they have disease in the left main, that can actually uh, affect their survival or cause uh, sudden death or mortality. So those are some indications where we might have to consider revascularization. So one, if they're refractory to uh, medical therapy, refractory chest pains to medical therapy, then yes, obviously go ahead and try to revascularize. Or if they don't have that and you go in and you see that there's left main disease, then you have to see whether that can be fixed with stents or do they have other high complexity. If they have high complexity and if they have left main disease, especially where the artery is branching out into the LAD, it's very complex to put in stents there. It can be done, but then we evaluate to see if they'll be a good suitable candidate for cabbage and uh, if that is the case they go that route and if not if it can be fixed with stents we go that route of putting in stents but sometimes people might not be a candidate for either a, a cabbage or PCI and those patients we have to just manage with medical therapy and then if you have multi-vessel coronary artery disease we have other factors that we look into in terms of the complexity of lesions what's the risk factors of the people undergoing cabbage versus PCI and I think my next slide talks about it so in patients with multi-vessel coronary artery disease, you may think like, how are we deciding who we send for bypass versus who we send for, uh, or who we stent? Like sometimes you see that some people have gotten like seven, eight stents and you're like, oh, why did this person just not get a bypass surgery if they required so many stents? And then in some people, uh, it's not feasible to undergo surgery and some people are better off with stents. So that's, these are some of the things we look at when we're deciding. So some things that favor PCI in terms of clinical features is if they have severe comorbidities, like if they're like morbidly obese or have other conditions which increases their risk during an open heart surgery. I tell people like open heart surgery is good for long term, but immediately during the surgery, it's a major surgery where you have to get your chest cracked open and uh, have to be able to deal with it during the acute period. But once they get through that, the long-term benefit is good because these bypass grafts, especially some of them, like the left internal ma mammary artery graft, tends to probably stay there forever without ever occluding. The chance of that stenosing very, very less. So that gives them more long-term benefit and maybe they don't have to keep coming back for more and more stents. But then you have to be strong enough to get through the immediate surgery itself. So advanced age, frailty, reduced life expectancy, there's no point of putting someone through an open heart surgery if they're 90 years old and not gonna live long or not doing that well. Or if they have restricted mobility and are not able to get through like cardiac rehab after the surgery, then we can't send them for surgery. But conditions like diabetes mellitus studies have shown that cabbage is better if they have multi-vessel coronary artery disease and diabetes mellitus and actually improving uh, has a mortality benefit. And then people with reduced uh, left ventricular function or someone uh, who cannot tolerate blood thinners, like anyone with stent has to get blood thinners. So anyone who cannot tolerate the blood thinners probably will benefit from undergoing uh, a bypass surgery. And people who have had stents before who keep, where the stents keep clogging up again and again and they're not able to tolerate uh, stenting, then we send them for cabbage. The other anatomical aspects that we consider when deciding between uh, PCI versus cabbage, there's some, we look at the complexity of lesions and there's some scores in interventional cardiology like syntax score, which looks at the scoring system based on the patient's age and the complexity, the presence of calciums in the blood vessels, their uh, renal function, their COPD status and few other factors. And we see that if the score is high, that means it's a more complex patient they would benefit from a cabbage versus if the score is low, they're someone who can be treated with PCI. And then uh, other things which, where they cannot undergo cabbage, like if they have a chest deformation, if they have had radiation therapy from a previous cancer, then it makes it very difficult for the surgeon or increases chance of uh, bleeding risk for the patient when the surgeon has to go in and cut through like scarring. Uh, if they've had like previous chest radiation. And if they've had a calcified iota, it's called a porcelain iota, where when actually when people go for a bypass surgery, they actually go on a bypass pump where your iota has to be cannulated and if it's calcified, that increases the risk of the surgery. And sometimes uh, 
if they're going for another open heart surgery like a valve surgery or an aortic surgery, probably it's uh, better they also get the bypass vessels fixed with in the same setting, so they would go for a cabbage. And next, we I'm going to switch switch gears and talk about people who come with an acute coronary syndrome, but NSTEMI, which is not an does not require urgent in, uh, emergent intervention, but might require urgent intervention. So the timing or urgency of angiography and intervention, as well as whether or not to proceed with angiography, depends on the clinical status of the patient when they come in with an NSTEMI. So an urgent or immediate invasive strategy, where we have to actually go in within two hours is indicated in patients who have like ongoing chest pain, where you're giving nitroglycerin and you're trying every medication, they're still having chest pain or they become hemodynamically unstable, like their blood pressures are dropping or they're getting extremely tachycardic or electrical instability. If, they're, if you're seeing a lot of arrhythmias like uh, VT happening, these are some indications where we might have to go in urgently to intervene even in an NSTEMI patient. Otherwise, most of the patients, they can wait for a little time with just medication in the initial, and that's considered early invasive strategy where uh, you can do it within 24 hours, where it's indicated in initially stabilized patients, but they can, if you leave them like that, beyond that, maybe they'll have increased risk of clinical events. And we have like some scoring systems, like the gray score, which can help us calculate that to see whether they fall in the high risk or the low risk category. Or patients who are having like dynamic changes, but they don't have these criteria of ongoing instability, then probably we can wait beyond two hours, but might have to be done within a day. The advantages of early invasive strategy over the delayed invasive, we're waiting uh, for like 25 to 72 hours. Sometimes it happens, like if it's not urgent, sometimes a patient comes in with a heart attack on a Friday evening. Unfortunately, the cath labs are closed on Saturday and Sunday and we have to wait till Monday. But sometimes they might fall into this category where they're unstable or they might fall into this category where they have like active changes happening and we might have to bring in the on-call team and uh, intervene on the weekend. But usually they end up waiting till Monday to get the procedure and they're here. The disadvantage of that is you're occupying a bed and they stay in the hospital for longer, which actually is more cost. And there's also ongoing ischemia until you go and fix the vessel. So if possible, we usually try to do everything within 24 hours or within a day or two, but sometimes based on some clinical factors or sometimes based on the availability of resources, we might have to delay the uh, procedure for up to 24 hours, uh, 72 hours or so. And next, uh, for those not at uh, higher and intermediate risk, as I spoke, a delayed invasive approach is reasonable. And sometimes we do what's called an ischemia-guided strategy. Not everyone with an NSTEMI needs to be rushed to a cath lab and has to undergo angiography. We look at other scoring systems, like the TIMI score or the low gray score, where low-risk patients can be just treated with medications in initially. But most of these people tend to convert to an invasive strategy where they're still having chest pain or they have some ischemia and we have to go in and intervene. But many of them might just get away with uh, medical therapy and might not need any angiogram during that admission. And then uh, invasive strategy is not recommended in patients if they have extensive comorbidities, like if they have hepatic failure or renal failure or lung failure or some form of cancer, probably it's more harmful if we go and intervene uh, rather than beneficial. So we have to always outweigh the risk versus benefit. And in someone who comes in with chest pain and has low likelihood of ACS, an invasive strategy with an angiogram is usually not recommended, and especially in women. I think they say women because the studies have shown that it's associated with higher risk of complications. This is just another breezy slide just showing that uh, when you have and STEMI, uh, whether it's definite or likely, different routes that we proceed with. And uh, mainly in everything that's common is a baby aspirin and then uh, a P2Y12 inhibitor, which is either uh, clopidogrel, which is Plavix, or Tigagrelor, which is Brillinta. Uh, and I'll go over like the timing and when to use which drug. And then uh, anticoagulation, just to emphasize, so we usually use an uh, these two, which is unfractionated heparin, which is the heparin drip, or enoxaparin, which is Lovenox sub-Q. One thing that uh, is good to know is heparin drip, we start immediately, and it continues till the patient actually comes into the cath lab, because once we turn it off, we're okay with it, and since we go radial axis, uh, the risk of bleeding is less, and since we also give heparin during the procedure, it's okay for them to stay on heparin. The disadvantage with that is, it's very difficult to get a therapeutic goal. So we always have like Q6 PTT checks, so inconvenient for the patient to get every six hour blood draws. 
but then uh, it's good turn on turn off medications or anyone who is at increased risk of bleed for low binox, uh, you get therapeutic level one shot and they're covered for 12 hours but one disadvantage with that is if someone comes in at 3 a.m and they have to get an angio you give a lobanox shot and they have to get an angiogram at 8 a.m they're still in the window where they've gotten lobanox and if you give heparin that increases their chance of bleeding so i recommend like if you start lobanox bid make sure that they get the last dose at least 12 hours, and if you think they still need anticoagulation, but the procedure is anticipated within the next 12 hours or so, make sure that uh, you probably consider heparin as opposed to Lovenox. And then uh, we have STEMI. STEMI is another setting where we uh, have to intervene urgently. I think we're cutting, getting close to the time, so I'm going to skip some of these. So any STEMI, if you're coming to a PCI-capable hospital, which is this hospital, uh, when we have STEMI coverage on call, uh, our goal is to open the vessel within 90 minutes. And they say FMC is first medical contact to device time. So that has to be done like from the patient coming into the door and getting to the cath lab and actually having the vessel open, which has to be within 90 minutes. Because they say time is muzzle in STEMI. Like the longer you have isch ischemia or like decreased blood supply, the chance of the muzzle recovering from it decreases and we want to minimize that as much as possible. And then if you go to a non-PCI capable hospital, uh, they say that you ha their goal is to get the patient in and out of the door. DDO is door in and door out, is within 30 minutes. If you're able to do that and the patient can go to another uh, facility and get the intervention done within 120 minutes, we have to transfer them immediately as possible for primary PCI. But then if they're not able to do that, and if you think it's going to be more than 120 minutes, it's better to administer a fibrinolytic agent like uh, alteplase or tenecteplase, and then uh, watch them and then transfer them eventually for a PCI. So the other thing with STEMI that's important, uh, which we don't routinely follow, but it's good to know, is patients, when we are deciding on primary PCI, if the symptom onset is within 12 hours, obviously we have to go and fix the lesion, but then there's some guidelines or studies that have shown that if they've had symptoms for greater than 12 hours, there's some indications where we have to still go in, like if they're having ongoing chest pain and heart failure, or they're in cardiogenic shock, we still have to go in and try to revascularize, but studies have shown that if the arteries are occluded for greater than 24 hours, the patient had symptoms for two, three days, the STEMI happened two, three days back, and you instantly notice that there's a STEMI, there's no Actually, it's harmful and not beneficial in doing a PCI after that. But usually, if, the way I look at it, if the patient is coming to the ED, even if they had a STEMI three days ago, if they're coming, they're having ongoing symptoms and they don't come without symptoms. So usually we attempt intervening all these people. But the chances of the vessel staying open or benefit is much lower. And then uh, sometimes when we go in and actually try to fix one vessel in the STEMI, we find other vessels which are also blocked. And uh, do we fix them or not? Uh, there's actually guidelines based on studies on that as well, saying that if they're actually in cardiogenic shock and they have other vessels involved, it's, we do not ha uh, fix the blockage at the same time. You might think, oh, but the other vessels are blocked, maybe because if they're shocky, let's fix everything at once and improve the flow. But when they're actually in cardiogenic shock, their kidneys are getting perfused less and their overall status and their catecholamine levels are pretty high and the risk of renal failure and other uh, damage is much more as opposed to when they're not in cardiogenic shock. So in cardiogenic shock, we just treat the main vessel, let them stabilize and bring them back to fix the other vessel at a later time. If it's a simple STEMI and they're clinically okay except for that one blockage and we find something else, if that can be fixed, we sometimes fix it on the same settings, but it depends on their overall clinical status, what makes us decide. So let's uh, talk a little about uh, P2Y12 inhibitors. Uh, so. P2Y12 inhibitors, the main three ones that we use are clopidogrel, which is Plavix, Prasugrel, which is Effient, and Ticagrelor, which is Brillinta. So it's recommended to load the patient with an oral P2Y12 inhibitor in a STEMI. So immediately you get an EKG, uh, and you see that the patient has to go to the cath lab, load them, and the most common one uh, for people here that I pref we use is uh, Brillinta, which is the Ticagrelor, which is 180 milligram dose. And uh, actually, Ticagrelor and Prasugrel, which is 60 milligrams dose, these two are preferred as opposed to Clopidogrel, with studies showing that it actually reduces uh, ischemic events compared to uh, 
Plavix, Brilliant already uses ischemic events when used in the setting of ACS, like NSTEMI or STEMI. But I'm talking only about STEMI, where I recommend loading the patient with any of these, and preferably Brilliant. The only caveat is Prasugrel is they recommend not giving Prasugrel loading until we see the anatomy, like not until I actually go in and do an angiogram and see the blood vessel, Prasugrel loading is not recommended. Next, it comes to NSTEMI, always the debate is I've had patients uh, come in from referral centers where like, oh, we're sending a patient for NSTEMI, it needs an angiogram, we're giving heparin drip and we'll also give uh, any of the other P2Y12 along with aspirin loading. And it's actually, there's no evidence that pretreatment with a potent P2Y12 inhibitor in patients undergoing an early invasive strategy, especially if they're going to get a cath within the next 24 hours or so, there's no point or no benefit in actually treating them with Plavix or Brilliant loading. And sometimes I've seen that it's actually harmful in a way, like I don't think there's any studies to prove that, but the thing is when Someone comes in with a loading dose of Plavix or Brillinta, and then I do an angiogram and I see multivessel disease. And then I send them for cabbage, and no surgeon is usually going to touch them for another five days. That increases the length of hospital stay, that actually delays, and you have ongoing ischemia, they're on blood thinners still then, they're on heparin drip, so there's prolonged hospital stay, increased risk of bleeding with that, and there's actually no evidence that treating them before is actually beneficial. So in NSTEMI, I recommend don't give dual antiplatelet agent and leave that up to the cardiology team and maybe until they do the angiogram, they, we usually don't give uh, a second antiplatelet agent. And next, uh, Prasugrel, uh, we don't use that as commonly in this hospital, but sometimes we see people who are already on it, but it's usually not recommended. There's many caveats with it in terms of you can't give it until you see the anatomy, so don't use it in STEMI, uh, in the ED, or if someone had a prior stroke or TI, it's actually harmful and older people and um, people with low BMI, it's as associated with increased risk of bleeding, so we do not use that as well. And then after the PCI, optimal medical therapy, uh, oral antiplatelet agents, statins, beta blockers, ACE or ARB is actually beneficial and has a associated with survival benefit at five-year follow-up, especially in patients with multivessel CAD. And uh, it also helps in reduction of the composite endpoint of death, MI, and stroke at five years as well. Let's switch gears and talk briefly about uh, PCI. Uh, so PCI, like first when it started, it was balloon angioplasty, 1977. So the first balloon angioplasty in um, living human was performed by Dr. Grunsek uh, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, but that, since then, angioplasty has evolved. In 1987, they invented bare metal stents, and then in 2002, three, they had first generation stent, drug eluding stents, where you had a stent which eluded drug, but it came with its own caveats. The stents were much thicker, and the drugs were not as efficient. But then we have more latest gens, and we are currently on the third and fourth generation, where we have bioresorbable stents, and stents with better drugs and uh, better durable polymer. But each one has its own caveats, and we'll talk about that in another slide. So just to show you like how a, a PTCA, or percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, is done. So you have a blockage like this. We put in a wire across the lesion, and then we take a balloon, and then inflate the balloon, and we have an opening in the vessel. Bob, you can think, oh, looks great. Why to even put in the stent? There's some disadvantages to it. Whenever we are actually working in this, it's not as simple as how it looks. You can actually dissect the vessel, like cause tears in the vessel wall. You can have recoil and coronary spasm where the vessel gets sensitized with the opening or the obstruction and releases uh, substances to cause spasm of the arteries, or you can have recoil of the vessel and result in acute closure of the vessel. So just that is not sufficient. And eventually, with time, you have inflammatory cell infiltration into the vessel wall and uh, smooth muscle cell proliferation, which results in restenosis. So the vessel is not going to stay open. The majority of restenosis following a PTCA requires time for the smooth muscle cells to proliferate. So it usually does not become clinically relevant until like one to six months after a PTCA. And uh, restenosis mainly is from all the things that I mentioned before, where it could be acute or later based on cell proliferation. And why do we put in stents? So we saw that initially people were just doing balloon angioplasty for many years where 
they would do a balloon angioplasty and maybe people were rushed to the OR because they dissected or everything closed up and they had to get and it was a very high chance of converting to open heart surgery at that time and balloon angioplasty was invented. It was a great invention to open the vessels but unfortunately it was not good long term. So then stents were invented and you have a stent, it actually goes on, a, it, it's, a, it's crumbed up on a balloon like as you see here, it goes in and we inflate the balloon and the stent stays there. Like people ask me, oh, is it going to come out when you put a nose stent? No, unfortunately, it stays there forever into the vessel wall and gets embedded as another layer in there. And it cannot be removed once it goes in there. I don't think even through surgery unless someone like dissects the vessel out. So vessel response to PCI, stent seals any coronary dissection. If you have a dissection, it's ki kind of occluding it, keeping it like that, and uh, it pre prevents the vessel recoil by providing radial support. So they eliminate elastic recoil and constructive remodeling, and uh, restenosis after stenting, it's mainly from neointimal proliferation and neoatherosclerosis. I think we can, the interest of time, I'm kind of going to go over, skip some slides. So just to compare the drug eluding and bare metal stents, we are no longer using bare metal stent, at least I think we have actually taken it out from our cath lab completely now. Before bare metal stents were used a lot because the question was, oh, this person needs a surgery in a month and uh, I, ca I have to keep them on blood thinners for longer because if it's a drug eluding stent, if we stop the blood thinner sooner, the stent can close off and form clots, which is called stent thrombosis. But then studies have shown that even with the latest generation of drug eluding stents, you can get away, and especially if they're at high risk of bleeding or need something urgently, you can get away with stopping the blood thinners after one month. It's not made it to the guidelines yet, uh, but since there's this newer stents which, uh, where we can get away with one month of DAPT if needed, we're actually getting away from bare metal because bare metal is associated with a lot of instant restenosis where people need more and more revascularization because there's no drug limiting the proliferation of cells into the stent, uh, causing blockades again and again. So we kind of have gotten away from bare metal stents. We don't see that used as often anymore. I'm going to skip these slides in the interest of time. Uh, just talking about access, uh, I, I just put like the advantages and disadvantages of femoral and radial artery access. And there's a lot of, uh, so femoral artery still remains the most common method used in US. Uh, actually other countries are better in this where they're using more radial than femoral, but we are slowly transitioning to more radial artery access. Femoral artery uh, becomes advantageous, especially if you have to use larger sheets and if it's more complex interventions, it's much easier and probably quicker to do it through the groin. There are some patient-related factors, procedure-related factors, which uh, have uh, associated with increased risk of bleeding and complications through the femoral artery. Females, whether it's radial or femoral, and older people are at increased risk of bleeding either way. Obviously, much more harmful if the bleed happens at the groin as opposed to the wrist. Uh, kidney disease and low BMI or high BMI predisposes you to increased risk of bleeding. Having an acute MI or heart failure does as well. Someone who's on periprocedural blood thinners or anticoagulation, uh, femoral is associated with high risk of bleeding. Just to show you, this is the normal femoral anatomy. You have the external iliac artery, the common femoral, and then that bifurcates into the superficial femoral and profunda femoris artery. This becomes important. Whenever we do uh, femoral artery access, we always get an angiogram to make sure where we actually entered with the needle. Becomes important because you see the sheath here. This tube here is the sheath. If you go higher, like this is your inferior epigastric artery and your inguinal ligament is coming down like this. And if you go higher, you're in the retroperitoneum. And if you bleed there for any reason, that's life-threatening where people, you see a patient after femoral artery access and if you see, the procedure note, and they mentioned it was a high stick, always look for a retroperitoneal bleed by doing a CAT scan. Even if it was not, it's always good to do a CAT scan after in a patient who is hypotensive after an angiogram. And if you have a low stick where your stick is somewhere here, it can still be done, but then when we have to use manual compression or compress, there's higher chance of bleeding in this area and higher risk of pseudoaneurysms that can be formed if we go low because you don't have a bony head to like actually compress your artery and especially if you're holding manual pressures, you might have slow leakage and pharmaceutical aneurysm there. So transradial 
PCI is recommended now, and it's actually the first-line approach in patients with stable ischemic heart disease uh, because it has benefits of lowering your vascular complications and bleeding. In acute coronary syndrome, there was actually studies which actually showed that it, it's associated with reduced mortality when we go radial versus femoral. Complications with that, you can have spasms in the arteries. Uh, there's risk of radial artery perforation, which can lead to bleeding and hematoma. Uh, but then we identify that early and... Uh, Management post-procedure is very important in terms of watching your vas band very cautiously. Sometimes the bleeding is limited and people just end up with the hematoma or bruising, but sometimes it can be more complicated where they would require surgeries to actually control the bleeding. And then radial artery occlusion is, I don't think we look for it as often, but the reason why we give heparin even during a diagnostic is to minimize the chance of radial artery occlusion. There have been studies shown, especially if you actually routinely do ultrasound on everyone, you would see probably clots form because the artery was manipulated, uh, but there's nothing, no guidelines on what, how you treat it with. If patients have symptoms, which they usually won't because you have ulnar artery supplying the thing, some people do anticoagulation for a few weeks and uh, repeat the scan to make sure the clot is, it's more for our self more than the patient because this usually doesn't cause symptoms, especially if they have good ulnar artery flow. Let's talk about the duration of DAPT and uh, aspirin is usually for life after a stent or if they have CAD. Uh, and then if you have a stent placed for stable ischemic heart disease, you give dual antiplatelet therapy for six months. If it's for acute coronary syndrome, you give it for 12 months. This is the standard. In patients treated with a drug editing stent with higher risk of bleeding, a shorter duration of DAPT, as I was telling earlier, either for one month if it's absolutely necessary, or at least three months, it may be reasonable. I have a few slides after to just go over that. Again, as I said, ACS, 12 months. If you have to discontinue it after one to three months, it's okay. Then if it's for stable ischemic heart disease, uh, shorter duration of DES, which is at least six months, and if they can tolerate it, maybe going up to 12 months is reasonable. So if you see my procedure notes, usually like after anyone who comes from home and gets it for just an abnormal stress test and I put in a stent, I say at least for six months and if it's reasonable, if they can uh, to tolerate for greater than 12 months. And sometimes we have to come off for various reasons. Uh, we have to come off the second antiplatelet agent. And if we have to do that, sometimes we prefer that we discontinue the aspirin and leave them on the P2Y12 monotherapy as opposed to discontinuing the other one. And even in cabbage, I feel a lot of people don't even practice this as much. Even in cabbage, and if they have had uh, a recent ACS, and then I, they've had an enstemy, and I send them for a cabbage, I usually, and actually the guidelines recommend that we do dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months. We don't see that commonly happen. This is something that gets missed a lot. And for stable ischemic heart disease, they undergo cabbage. It's reasonable to continue, but it's not a class one recommendation. But if it was actually a recent NSTEMI or STEMI and they undergo cabbage, you have to, it's recommended with a class one recommendation, which is a strong recommendation to continue dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months. And this is just showing recent NSTEMI, whatever it may be, whether you treat it with medical therapy, cabbage, or lytics, or PCI, 12 months is what the way to go, unless there's any risk of bleeding. So perioperative management, it's recommended that uh, elective non-cardiac surgery should be delayed for at least 30 days after bare metal stents and optimally six months after drug eluding. Uh, in patients treated with DAPT after PCI, who must undergo surgical procedures uh, that mandate the discontinuation? It is recommended that aspirin is continued through the procedure and the P2Y12 inhibitor, we say, just started as soon as possible when the surgeon says it's okay to restart. Then uh, non-cardiac surgery requiring interruption of DAP, uh, it's, we have to have discussion between the different clinicians to see what's the relative risk. Can the surgery wait or should we like, can we continue the antiplatelet therapy during the surgery or do we have to stop everything uh, or not? And then elective non-cardiac surgery after DES implantation in patients for whom P2Y12 therapy will be discontinued may be considered after three months if the risk of further delay of surgery is greater than the expected risk of stent thrombosis. So if it can wait longer, wait for six months, but if not, at least three months. Sometimes if the surgery can't wait, we're okay after 30 days, but at least 30 days for an elective surgery is what is recommended. This is a good flow chart that shows all that on whatever I spoke about. So Actually doing surgery within 30 days and stopping the blood thinners is associated with stent thrombosis, which can 
which is actually very harmful and can result in massive MI. So preferred not to do any surgery within the first 30 days. And then uh, we have a lot of patients with atrial fibrillation who also undergo PCI. So for that, the guidelines actually recommend that uh, we initially, immediately after the PCI, they're on triple therapy. You have an oral anticoagulant and then aspirin and the P2Y12. And you can actually discontinue the aspirin after one to four weeks. It's a wide range. We usually recommend at least four weeks, but older patients, if you think they're going to bleed, the base is anemic, but you need a stent and you also need an oral anticoagulation, they can come off as early as one week. But usually, clinically in practice, we at least do two to four weeks and ideally four weeks of triple therapy and then come off aspirin. And when they're on triple therapy, it's recommended that you can consider a lower warfarin or INR uh, target of 2 to 2.5 as opposed to the usual 2 to 3. So keep the INR a little bit on the lower side. And then in patients with AF who are undergoing PCI, actually studies have shown that probably a NOAC uh, it's no longer known, like a direct oral anticoagulant. It's no longer a new oral anticoagulant. It's a direct oral anticoagulant. Like uh, either Eliquis, Zeralto, or Paraxa, that can, is better in terms of lower uh, risk of bleeding as opposed to warfarin itself. Then to briefly touch on mechanical circulatory support devices, uh, there's various available in the market. Uh, we have only one available in our hospital, which is the intraatic balloon pump. Uh, the other things which are commonly used are Impel and ECMO. Uh, why do we even need this? It actually helps in providing circulatory support by increasing your mean arterial pressure. It helps with unloading of the left ventricle in terms of relieving the pressure and also reducing the volume. It also improves uh, myocardial perfusion and gives some coronary support as well. So these are the devices that are available. We have the balloon pump. I'm going to talk more about balloon pump since we uh, see that more in the ICU and elsewhere. Impella is something which is a device that usually goes through the grind and uh, it has like a motor propeller which sits across the aortic valve. It's actually sucking out blood from the left ventricle and uh, releasing blood into the ascending iota and it actually kind of acts as a bypass for the LV. We don't have that here. Maybe at some point, if you get it in the future, I'll give you a talk on that at that time. And then ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxidation. The reason I even bring this up is even though we don't have it here, it's a good lifesaver. In my training, we used to do a lot of these in people who are critically ill and there's nothing else. They do it in demoines. So if you have a sick patient, it doesn't have to be cardiac, but even pulmonary embolism and they're critically ill and you need an emergent, it's a te while the patient is recovering or healing from the disease process, it's a good way where you have another machine like acting as an artificial heart for you. I've seen it do miracles and very life saving, especially if you have younger patients who are critically ill. It's a good device you have to think of, especially being in the ICU or uh, taking care of those patients so that we could transfer them to other places which actually do it. Uh, indications for mechanical support uh, in STEMI, we usually use balloon pumps, uh, if, especially if the patient is in cardiogenic shock who do not stabilize with pharmacological therapy, or you can, if that's not working, Impella would be the next go, which when we actually transfer patients from here to get that at other centers. In NSTEMI, sometimes if people have ongoing angina, since it's pro it provides coronary support, it's a good, uh, balloon pump is a good device to help with it, either if they have hemodynamic instability or if they have some mechanical complications, especially in mitral regurgitation, it works great by reducing the afterload. Uh, balloon pump is a good device. Everything comes with complications. Uh, these devices are pretty big. Like I was telling you about a two millimeter catheter that goes to do the angiogram, and these devices are about three to five millimeters uh, varying. And since it's a bigger hole associated with more bleeding risk, and it can cause occlusions of the arteries, especially if they have underlying PAD. And balloon pump, especially when it sits in the iota, I'm going to show you a picture on that. It can cause hemolysis with every inflation and deflation that happens. And actually, you see people develop like anemia and thrombocytopenia on it. So how does the balloon pump act? Uh, I have a good picture that shows us. Yeah. So this is a balloon, which is like a cylindrical tube which is filled with helium with every inflation. So it in, when it inflates, it's actually uh, kind of occluding the descending iota transiently. And with that, what happens is you have a column of blood. Usually coronary flow happens in diastole. So in diastole, your iotic valve is closed. And then this balloon inflates. And you have a column of blood that forms here. With that, you have a high pressure. 
or a volume of blood that's sitting in the ascending aorta, so you have increased coronary perfusion. So with that, you have improved myocardial oxygen supply. In systole, it, you have deflation of the balloon, and it kind of creates kind of a suction. And with every systolic beat, when it, it's causing the deflation of the suction, you have a reduced in afterload. And with that, your LV is doing less work. And just to show how it looks on the screen, so this is your balloon pump screen. People who work in the ICU and other uh, people taking care of patients with balloon pump might have seen it. You have an EKG lead, and you have a trigger that's identifying diastole and systole on the EKG. And this is the balloon pump in action, like which is giving one-to-one -one support. For every beat, your balloon, with every heartbeat, your balloon is inflating and deflating. So when it inflates is when you see this pressure go up, which is called the diastolic augmentation. So this part, if you see correlating with this, is happening in diastole. So this peak, or the augmented pressure here, if you see, is 93 millimeters. So the blood pressure just with the balloon inflation is getting augmented. The diastolic pressure is getting augmented to 93. And then you have a drop. And in systole, you actually see that it's dropping. The systolic pressure is only 60. That's the goal. People are like, oh, with the balloon pump, why is my blood pressure dropping? But that's the goal. You're trying to reduce the afterload so the heart actually works less with pumping. So you have a drop in your systolic pressure, and your diastolic pressure is pretty high. And if you calculate the mean arterial pressure, mean arterial pressure, the main contribution is from your diastole. So your mean is actually preserved and more than your systolic, which is unusual. Usually your MAP pressure is much less than your systolic, but your mean is higher than your systolic. So that's what the balloon pump is supposed to do. If you see this waveform where you have a good peak way above the initial systolic notch, that means that the balloon pump is working great. And you would, like, even though it's a simple device with the simple mechanism of action, it does great in a lot of people in helping them recover through uh, the initial phase after a big MI. And, uh, I just wanted to bring up this slide. We get x-rays routinely on a balloon pump patient. This is how it looks on a chest x-ray. This is a balloon pump that was, I think the film was taken during an inflation. This is a column of air in the balloon, and this is the tip. The reason I bring up this slide is it's important. This is the position where we want the tip at the level of the carina. This is the aortic knob, and there have been cases where it gets displaced with the patient moving. If it gets displaced, you can actually go and occlude the subclavian artery, which can cause ischemia of the limb. And if it's too low, sometimes the augmentation is not enough. And if it's too low, the other thing is down below in the iota, you have the renal arteries and the mesenteric arteries coming, especially if people have underlying disease with every inflation, you can cause temporary uh, ischemia to the renal arteries. And sometimes we see the kidney function going up because of that reason. So it's important that we get daily x-rays on these people with balloon pumps and make sure the position is not too out of whack. So it's important for all the people t involved in taking care of this patient to look at these and make sure that it's in good position. Sorry that I took over time, uh, but thank you and any welcome to take any questions.